Good morning to everybody. Uh, my name is Joseph Alessi, uh, and I'm the new program director of the Congressional App Challenge. Um, hoping to uh, have an opportunity to speak to some of you guys off the record about that today. Uh, but for now, I'll be going ahead and introducing our next speaker, Representative Mike Doyle, a 13-term congressman from the 18th District of Pennsylvania. He is also the chairman of the subcommittee uh, the Commerce Subcommittee on Communications and Technology. Uh, so let's welcome Representative Doyle. Good morning, and thank you. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. Uh, I want to thank Tim Lorden for inviting me to speak to you and the Internet Education Foundation for hosting the State of the Net Conference. I also want to thank the Foundation for all the good work it does as part of the Congressional App Challenge, which is encouraging students in participating congressional districts to design, build, and submit a software application. Uh, our office has been participating in the App Challenge for the last several years, and last year our winning submission was an app called Rocket Weather. The team of students submitted an app and designed it to help them determine weather conditions for their model rocket launches. That app is available online at rocketweather.us if you want to check it out. This competition is an excellent example of how stakeholders can engage kids in STEM. You know, the most frequent complaint I hear from business executives isn't about taxes or regulation. It's about getting and retaining talented employees. Far too often when I ask CEOs what's holding back the growth of their companies, I hear that they can't find talented people for the positions they need, particularly in the high-tech industries. Engaging students early and often and getting them interested in STEM is critical for building our nation's talent pipeline. Now, I know folks are eager to hear what Democrats in the House plan to do over the next two years, now that we are once again in the majority, and particularly what we plan to do on telecommunications and other technology issues. Well, I'm going to start by telling you a little bit about how my hometown of Pittsburgh has changed in recent years and how that will inform my views in my new role as chairman of the Communications and Technology Subcommittee. I've had the honor of representing Pittsburgh for 24 years now, and a lot has changed over that time in Pittsburgh and around the world. We've gone from being a city fueled by heavy manufacturing to one with a highly diversified economy. Today, Pittsburgh is a world leader in a number of critical emerging technologies for the 21st century, such as cybersecurity, artificial intelligence, robotics, and autonomous systems, as well as being named as one of the most livable cities. When I came to Congress, our city, like so many other parts of the country that depended on manufacturing, was struggling. When most people think of Pittsburgh, they think of the steel industry. My grandfather and father both worked in steel mills. For so many families in our region, uh, it wasn't a job, it, it was a way of life. We got too comfortable, however, and we didn't see that other countries were out innovating and out competing us. And as a result, Pittsburgh, like so many other parts of the country with large manufacturing industries, fell behind. Many of the plants and the mills closed, and a lot of people lost their jobs. And it's taken a long time for Pittsburgh to recover, and the city's still working its way through that process. But I want to emphasize the positive change that's taken place, particularly the dramatic growth at Pittsburgh as a high-tech research hub over the last 40 years. Today, in addition to our traditional leadership in material sciences, we've become leaders in the growing and often connected fields of computers, robotics, IT, and healthcare. Pittsburgh is a hotbed of innovation and development in these important sectors. Pittsburgh's a great example of a community that has worked successfully to make the transition from a one industry town dependent on heavy manufacturing to a more diversified knowledge-based economy. Community leaders have worked hard to promote growth in the business sectors that we've identified as important industries of the coming decades. Those efforts have included improving our business climate and making our region more attractive to high-tech businesses through support for business incubators, entrepreneur training, and venture capital. And we've worked hard to nurture some of the greatest regional assets, 
world-class research centers like Carnegie Mellon University, the University of Pittsburgh, and the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. The region has produced scientists and entrepreneurs who are leaders in their field, such as Chad Hurley of YouTube, Chuck Geschke of Adobe, and Louis Von Ahn of Duolingo. Research from local universities has been spun off into hundreds of successful startups. And we worked hard to facilitate the establishment and growth of such startups. And look at the companies that have decided to set up research facilities in Pittsburgh, like Google, Apple, Amazon, Facebook, Disney. Clearly, a number of global tech companies see major advantages to locating in Pittsburgh. Our resurgence has been fueled by our embrace of innovation and disruptive technologies, as well as a regional drive towards partnership, collaboration, and research and development to create an environment that attracts and retains talented individuals and fosters technologies and new ideas. For instance, supporting the Robotics Institute at CMU and the National Robotics Engineering Center has resulted in our region becoming a world leader in the field of robotics, autonomy, and artificial intelligence. The first autonomous vehicles were designed and built in Pittsburgh. The city was among the first to have autonomous vehicles deployed on our roads, and today we are headquarters of multiple major autonomous vehicle companies, including Argo AI, Aurora, and Uber, all located in Pittsburgh. We're also leading the way in the field of cybersecurity through CMU Scilab, and the Department of Defense's Software Engineering Institute, where researchers are developing new techniques and technologies to secure IoT devices and embedded systems. A range of startups and spin-outs have emerged out of these research centers, making Pittsburgh a world-leading center on cybersecurity. Increasingly, we're seeing these areas of expertise overlap and complement each other whether that's experts in embedded system security, testing of autonomous vehicles, navigation and machine learning algorithms, or artificial intelligence being used to create smart cyber defenses that can automatically detect and defend against cyber intrusions, like CMU's Cyber Grand Challenge winner did. These technologies are poised to change the world, and we're leading the way in Pittsburgh. And while I'm very excited about these technologies and the promise they hold for Pittsburgh and beyond, it's clear to me that we also have many difficult challenges ahead. Never in our nation's history has our politics interacted so powerfully with the technology that assists Americans in their everyday lives. The internet is no longer novel. It's becoming an indispensable component in almost every aspect of our lives. Obviously, it is now a critical part of how we carry out our jobs, communicate with friends and family, and participate in our democracy. This multifaceted nature of the internet medium poses unique challenges for policymakers. Access to the digital world is now of paramount concern to everyone. While these technologies hold incredible promise to improve lives and expand opportunity, none of this is possible without access. One of my priorities in Congress will be looking at ways to expand access to the internet. In our country, we face two principal challenges. One is a lack of deployment, and the other is a lack of affordability. In rural and urban areas alike, people have problems getting access to affordable, high-speed internet services. In rural areas, deployment of broadband can be so expensive that there's simply no business case for building out the necessary infrastructure. Last Congress, Democrats on the Energy and Commerce Committee, led now by Chairman Pallone, introduced the Lift America Act, an infrastructure bill that would have put $40 billion towards addressing these gaps and would have put us on a path to solving this problem. And while there are existing programs to facilitate broadband build out in rural communities, they are underfunded and the speed of service is often too slow to take full advantage of modern internet services, such as streaming video, distance learning, and telemedicine. In urban areas, far too many people can't afford services, and in low-income communities, too many people are excluded from access to high-quality service through digital redlining. In Detroit and Cleveland, for instance, one provider hasn't made broadband infrastructure improvements in the majority of census blocks with individual poverty rates above 
ISP shouldn't be cherry picking the most profitable neighborhoods for service, upgrade, and investment. Additionally, I believe Congress needs to provide much more vigorous oversight of the FCC and the Universal Service Program. As currently constituted, for example, the Connect America Fund will forever relegate rural Americans to the status of second-class broadband citizens. And for those low-income Americans who can't afford service, the FCC seems intent on pushing more and more folks out of the Lifeline program, which provides phone and internet service to veterans, seniors, the disabled, and at-risk individuals and families. This program is about giving people a way to find a job connect with emergency services, and participate in society. It seems to me that we would want to encourage people to participate in this program and make it easier to sign up. The Commission's single-minded focus on restricting access to this program and its attacks on tribal and Native American communities fly in the face of the goals of this program that was established to achieve those things. I hope, along with my colleagues on the subcommittee, including our friends on the other side of the aisle, that we can examine these programs and the Commission's policies, as well as look at legislative solutions for closing the digital divide. Another challenge that we hope to address this year is net neutrality. To me, this is one of the preeminent digital rights issues we face today, as it is for many Americans. I supported the Wheeler FCC when it passed strong and forcible open internet rules in 2015. And I was happy to see those rules upheld in full by the DC Court of Appeals. At that point, I had hoped the issue was finally resolved. However, uh, since then, there's been a change of administrations. And as we all know, elections have consequences. And this one has had major consequences, not only in telecommunications. In 2016, the FCC under Chairman Pai began a proceeding to roll back these rules against the largest ever outcry of opposition to a federal rulemaking proceeding, a proceeding I would add that there are many unanswered questions about. Commissioner Rosenworcel spoke at this event, event last year, and while she didn't talk about net neutrality explicitly, she described a myriad of cases of individuals whose identities were stolen and then used to file fraudulent comments supporting Chairman Pai's re repeal proposal. These phony comments and other similar efforts constitute a massive, well-funded attack on our democratic process, and I believe they should be investigated and addressed. Last Congress, I led a bipartisan effort in the House to restore net neutrality. Senator Markey led a similar bipartisan effort in the Senate. Over on the Senate side, they were able to force a vote on the measure, and it passed with the support of a number of Republican senators. Unfortunately, my colleagues on the other side of the aisle refused to bring this bill up in the House for a vote. So while we came up short in the last Congress, I plan to continue my efforts to restore net neutrality rules and bring light to this issue. Americans around the country overwhelmingly support strong net neutrality rules on a bipartisan basis. People understand that their ISPs have far too much control over their connection to the internet and the services they care about. Whether it's slowing Netflix down, blocking access to innovative mobile services, or adopting anti-competitive zero rating policies, the track record for ISPs on this issue is clear, and consumers and businesses want the protections and certainty that these rules provide. I intend to make net neutrality the subject of our first subcommittee hearing. It's also important that the American people know that Congress is working to address this issue. I also hope the subcommittee can address the nation's spectrum needs and the many challenges and opportunities posed by 5G wireless networks. Last Congress, I was the lead sponsor of a bipartisan bicameral Airways Act. This bill would have set in motion a number of proceedings at the FCC to auction licensed spectrum and to free up new unlicensed bands. Making more spectrum available is essential for delivering fast wireless broadband, faster Wi-Fi, and hopefully enabling new competitive broadband services to launch as well. For example, a wireless startup broadband provider named Starry started operating in Boston and recently launched in DC and Los Angeles. 
The company uses point-to-multipoint -point microwave technology to provide high-speed wireless internet at a fraction of the cost of traditional wireline broadband. The Airways Act sought to make this kind of competitive product easier for entrepreneurs to deploy by freeing up the necessary spectrum. The bill also included an innovative spectrum auction dividend. The legislation directed a portion of the auction proceeds towards building out wireless broadband in unserved and underserved areas. We need to find new ways to leverage the value of spectrum as an asset and the revenue the federal government is bringing in through the auction process while at the same time getting this essential resource to the private industry that wants to bring faster wireless internet access to consumers. You know, for far too long, spectrum auction revenue has largely gone down the black hole of deficit reduction. We need to find a better model to use this revenue to help close the digital divide. For example, wireless carriers believe that mid-band spectrum will be the key to deploying 5G service. An emerging opportunity to free up some of this spectrum exists in the C-band, where several satellite providers currently operate. These companies largely provide video transport capacity for our nation's cable operators and video content companies, allowing them to distribute cable program throughout the country. NPR and a number of other broadcasters also use this service for similar distribution purposes. The satellite providers have proposed selling some of their much sought after spectrum to the wireless carriers who by some analyst estimates may pay satellite providers as much as $60 billion for this spectrum. The satellite carriers want to conduct this transaction as a private sale, where they get to keep all the revenue from the auction, pick the winners and losers, and decide how that spectrum is allocated. I think we have to ask ourselves, why should the FCC allow a group of foreign satellite providers to walk away with potentially tens of billions of dollars that could be used to solve our country's own broadband needs. That $40 billion figure for the Lift America Act, that's aspirational, but it would provide fiber internet access to 98% of the people in our country. I believe this proposal brings up a lot of questions that need to be answered before any transaction moves forward. I hope to work with my colleagues on both sides of the aisle to address this issue and advance legislation in Congress that can address our nation's spectrum needs. Now, at their core, all the proposals I discussed are about getting people online, deploying broadband, and ensuring that consumers can use that connection to access the products and services they want. But there's also some real questions about what's going on online. Last Congress, our committee held several hearings with executives from major internet companies, including Mark Zuckerberg of Facebook and Jack Dorsey of Twitter. At those hearings, Democrats on the committee expressed a lot of concerns with the practices and policies of those platforms. Those concerns range from data privacy and tracking users across the internet to the impact these platforms were having on our democracy. These are important questions that we need to continue to ask because these platforms aren't just an aspect of our public discourse. They are becoming the main forums for our public dis discourse. They are the places where increasingly we are debating and deliberating policy and the rules and structure of these platforms impact that public debate. I believe public debate and discussion on the web can make us a better nation but I think it's important for Congress to exercise its oversight role to understand what's going on online and ask the important questions about what companies are doing and why. That's what our constituents sent us to Washington to do, and I believe that's what we should be doing. My hope is that all people around our country can benefit from these incredible technologies because I believe our nation is richer when the opportunity is inclusive. And our country, like Pittsburgh, is better and stronger when we embrace innovation and chase for the future. I, from one, am excited to see what comes next. Uh, I wanna thank you all for inviting me here to speak today and I hope you enjoy the rest of your conference. Thank you.